I come now to give you some special helps to use against a few corruptions in particular. The last chapter, I gave you some general directions on how to mortify your bosom sin. But now I will give you more specific advice on how to mortify three notable corruptions, namely unclean lusts, spiritual pride, and reigning anger. I cannot think of any other corruptions that more commonly make incursion into the minds of men than these three. I will address each of them very briefly, beginning with the first by laying down five or six helps on how to subdue and mortify unclean lusts. Several helps for mortifying unclean lusts. Number one, live in a continual and serious mindfulness of the all-seeing eye of God upon you. Indeed, this is a universal remedy against all sin, but even the scriptures apply this help to the sin of lust. In Job chapter 31 verse 1, he says, quote, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Close quote. And in verse 4 he says, quote, Does not the Lord see my ways? and count all my steps, close quote. There is nothing that will contribute more to controlling our lusts than the consideration of God's omnividence, that he sees and takes notice of all our ways. I heard the story of a maiden that was earnestly solicited by a young man to sexual uncleanness, and she told him that if he could bring her to a place where no eye might see them, she would yield to his desires. And so the young man led her out of one room and into another, and when they were in a most secret and retired place, he thought he would have his desire of her. Oh, but the eye of God is still upon us. He sees us and takes notice of us, she said. And upon this very consideration, they remained chaste from that time forward. Number two, lay a special fence and safeguard upon your outward senses. And the Apostle Peter speaks of some that had, quote, eyes full of adultery, close quote, who could not cease from sin, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, you should set a watch over your eyes. Take heed of lewd and lascivious looking, for it is a window that will let a world of lust into your heart. If you would root out and cleanse yourself from fleshly lusts, a very effective method is by setting a watch over your eyes so that they may not gaze upon vanity, even as Job said, quote, I have made a covenant with my eyes, close quote. Job chapter 31, verse 1. You cannot control fleshly lusts if you do not keep your eyes from wanton glances. And hence we read of Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20, verse 16 when he surrendered up Sarah, Abraham's wife, to him. He said to her, quote, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all them that are with thee and with all others. Close quote. Well, this was a reproof to her that a wife should not cast her eyes in a lustful way upon anyone except her husband. He must be a covering of her eyes unto all that are with her. Okay, to those of you who can't understand that, that means no flirting. Number three, use a moderation of meat and drink. Now, there are some kinds of food 
and indeed an excess in any kind of food, which provoke us unto lust. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, the Apostle Peter describes wicked men as having eyes full of adultery, even as they feast with you. And moreover, this is the reason for Paul's expression in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, where he says, quote, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, and so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, close quote. Number four, if you would suppress fleshly lusts, then be careful to curb your thoughts when lust first begins to enter them. When a man allows thoughts to lodge in his heart, contemplating them with complacency, it is a thousand to one that they will eventually lead to the act. It is a great provocation to sexual impurity for a man to cherish erotic fantasies in his mind and in his heart, or to allow his thoughts to linger on some lewd object, as in Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 19, quote, She multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt, close quote. The restraining and curbing of our thoughts is a great help to the mortification of this sin. I have made a covenant with my eyes, says Job. He does not say, why therefore should I look upon a maid? But why therefore should I think upon a maid? Close quote. Job chapter 31, verse 1. Number five. If you would mortify and subdue fleshly lusts, consider that there is a great deal more real evil in the sin of uncleanness than there is seeming goodness in it. In Proverbs chapter 7, verses 15 through 17, where the harlot works to persuade and entice a young man to be unclean with her, she says, quote, Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon, close quote. One theologian notes that she joins together two bitter things and one sweet. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Now, cinnamon is the only one that is sweet. The other two are very bitter things, and this implies to us that there is twice as much real misery and evil in the sin of sexual immorality as there is of seeming joy and delight in it. There is myrrh and aloes, two bitter things to one sweet. More real evil and bitterness in it than in its seeming goodness. Number six, consider seriously and frequently the evils that accompany and are associated with the sin of sexual uncleanness. Letter A. First, there is thievery in this sin, or you rob a body that is not your own, even as it is said in John chapter 8, verse 4, quote, This woman was taken in adultery, in the very act, close quote. Now, in the original, it is, 
she was taken in the very theft, implying that adultery is no better than theft. And in Proverbs 9, verses 17 and 18, committing adultery with a woman is called stolen waters. Quote, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Close quote. And this is clearly spoken of a harlot. And it follows, But he knoweth not the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Letter B. This sin also brings infamy and disgrace upon a man. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 33, quote, He that committeth adultery, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away, close quote. Letter C. It procures poverty in a man's estate. By it, a man is brought to beggary. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 3, we read, He that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. And in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26, By means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a morsel of bread. Letter D. It will consume your flesh and your bones. It will corrupt your blood and weaken your whole body. Solomon speaks of the harlot in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 11. Quote, Remove thy foot far from her, and come not near the door of her house, lest thou mourn at last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Close quote. Letter E. It makes a man a veritable warehouse of a wide variety of diseases. Letter F. It brings stupidity upon the heart. A man that is sexually impure is a stupid sinner who is void of understanding. Wine and women, they take away the heart of a man. Hosea chapter 4 verse 11. Thus I have done with the helps against this first sin of unclean lusts. Several Helps for Mortifying Spiritual Pride But, says another man, alas, I would be happy if I had no sin to fear but unclean lusts. But the Lord be merciful to me, for I am troubled with spiritual pride. I cannot undertake any gracious act or perform any duty without becoming puffed up with spiritual pride. Answer. I shall give you four helps against this sin. Number one. If you would subdue spiritual pride, consider that even the best of us have much greater reasons for abasement and humiliation than we do for pride. For even the best of us have more sin in us than grace, even as there are more pebbles than diamonds in the quarry, and more thorns than roses on the bush. And in the same way, there is more sin in any of our hearts than there is grace. Why then should any of us be proud? Though you may have good graces in you, yet you still have a very bad, polluting, and sinful nature. Number two, live in continual and serious consideration that all the gifts and talents that you have, of which you are so proud, they were all bestowed upon you as a gift, as a mere act of donation from God. 
Now, if all the gifts you have were freely given to you by God in his bounty, then why should you be a proud person? Would you think it proper for a beggar to be proud of the clothes that another man has given him? Well, the same is true with you. All that you have, these things, are mere alms, gifts, and acts of grace and mercy from God, which have been bestowed upon you. Even as the Apostle tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, quote, What has thou, O man, which thou hast not received? Close quote. Now this thought should humble us. Number three. If you would subdue your spiritual pride, remember that of all things in the world, pride is the very thing which will most weaken and undermine your gifts. In James chapter 4, verse 6, we read that, quote, The Lord giveth more grace to the humble, but he resisteth the proud, close quote. He fights against the proud man as a warrior in battle. He gives grace to a humble heart, but not to the proud heart. Therefore, take heed of being lifted up in the spirit, or being lifted up in spirit. And if you are, it should be a great check to your pride to consider that pride stifles and strangles grace in your soul. As the lowest valleys are more fruitful, most fruitful, so the most humble Christians are most fruitful in grace. And moreover, Philosophers have clearly stated why the evil of this sin rises above all others, and it is because other vices merely oppose their contrary virtues. But pride fights against every virtue and grace. It is easy to see how other vices oppose their corresponding virtues. Fear opposes hope. Sorrow overwhelms joy. Covetousness cancels out generosity, and so forth. But pride is a sin that nullifies every virtue and every grace. Number four. A great help for subduing and mortifying pride in your heart is to ponder the great disproportion that there is between yourself and God, between yourself and others, and between yourself and yourself. Letter A. There is a great disproportion between yourself and God. Oh, he infinitely exceeds you. He is like the glorious sun, and you are like a clod of dirt. He is the righteous judge of heaven and earth, and you are the poor sinful dust and ashes of it. Let her be. There is a great disproportion between yourself and others. Well, there are many others who have had less time and enjoyed less means of grace than you have, and yet are a great deal more proficient in the school of Christ than you. The serious consideration of this should undermine and suppress your pride. Let her see. There is a great disproportion between yourself and yourself. You are proud of the gifts you now have. But... Oh, man, consider what you were in Adam before the fall. You come far short 
of the gifts and abilities you had in him. Look also to the disproportion between what you are now and what you were at your first conversion. Perhaps you were a man full of grace, fervent in prayer, full of affection for God, and zealous for him as well. But now your zeal has grown cold. You are dead and formal in your duties and you lack many of the graces which you formerly did exercise. You are like a certain tribe of heathens I have read about. The first year they offered gold unto their gods. The next year they offered silver. And the third year nothing at all. Thus at first, at first... You were fruitful in grace, but then you started to wither and decay. And now you are worst of all, and yet more proud than ever. If you will regularly meditate upon these considerations, I believe that they will prove powerfully effective at subduing any pride that is in your heart. I mean, look at it this way, brethren. We can't even breathe without God commanding it so. So we should watch ourselves and not fall into the sin of pride. Several helps to mortify reigning anger. I come now to the third sin, which is reigning anger. By the way, reigning here is spelled R-E-I-G-N-I-N-G. Reigning. Oh, says another man, neither of the two sins previously mentioned troubles me that much. But alas, I am a man of a stubborn and reckless disposition, and I am prone to outbursts of anger. Thus would I be glad to learn how I might subdue and mortify this sin in me. Answer. I will give you six remedies to help bridle your passions when your anger is provoked by some insult or injury. Number one. Consider that you have, been, or that you have given God a much greater reason for being angry with you than any man has ever given you for being angry with him. If the Lord were strict in marking what you have done amiss and repaid you for every injury that you have done to him in your heart, you would have been thrown into hell long ago. That's Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Let this thought pacify and subdue your anger. Number two, remember that all the insults and injuries that come to you in order to provoke you and stir up your passion, they come by the providence of God. And the thought of this softened David's anger when Shimei cursed his name and cast stones and dust at him. Let him alone, said David, for God hath bidden him do it. That's 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11. Number three, when an occasion for anger arises, labor to delay and put off the execution of your wrath. Take time to think before you allow your fury and indignation to vent themselves. Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16, quote, A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth his shame, close quote. A fool cannot conceal his wrath, which erupts immediately, but a wise man will, quote, cover his shame, close quote, for it is shameful to be angry, and thus 
a wise man will cover and conceal his passion. Number four, another great help for mortifying anger is to depart from the company of the man that is angry with you or who would provoke you to be angry with him. The way to quench your temper is to leave the presence of a man that has just injured you. And thus we read in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 34, that when Saul was angry with Jonathan, Jonathan left the presence of his father. Likewise, Abraham and Lot, they parted ways to avoid a falling out. Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Solomon says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways, and get a snare to thy soul. Proverbs 22, verses 24 through 25. If you are with a furious man, and he snarls at you, and you at him, this will only increase your anger. Number five. To pacify your passion, when you receive any insult or injury which provokes you to anger, strive to bear the occasion or injury in silence. Do not utter a multitude of words about it, for in this sense, words are like the wind, and as the wind kindles a fire, causing it to grow and to spread, so Words will kindle wrath. We read in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 21, As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. A multitude of words will provoke to passion. Therefore, when you are angry, keep it in and do not utter word after word and reproach after reproach, for that is the way to increase your anger. Number six, to dissuade you from giving rein to your anger, consider that this sin carries many other sins in its womb. You may commit other sins in isolation, but when you vent your anger, you cannot help but commit many other sins with it. And this is very true. Your, narr your narrator is telling you it's, this is very true. In Proverbs 29, verse 22, Solomon says, quote, A furious man aboundeth in transgression, close quote. Well, sometimes pride is mixed with anger. Sometimes murder is a consequence of it, as in Genesis chapter 49, verse 6, where Simeon and Levi, in their anger, killed a man. And there is an abundance of sin wrapped up in the womb of anger. And if you will remember this, it may be very helpful at suppressing and keeping it subdued. And now we come to the portion of the use of application. Thus have I finished giving you special directions for mortifying these three sins in particular, which I hope, if seriously considered, may be of some use and benefit to you. Now, all that remains is to give a word or two by way of use, to wind up all that has been said regarding this doctrine of mortification. In parting, I would like to give you four or five general points of advice. Number one, when you have subdued and mortified one sin, be ready and alert for another to try to rise up in its place. Beloved, a Christian's life is one of continual warfare. I'm going to read that again. A Christian's life is one of continual warfare. 
The Christian must engage in combat with spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. The devil will never leave you alone. If one temptation does not prevail, he will send in another, and another, and another after that. It's nonstop, beloved, from morning to night. And when one lust or corruption is mortified, another will soon rise up in its place. And therefore, you must continually stand guard. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Number two, do not be content with the small beginnings of mortification. Many men, because their lusts cease, they therefore think they are mortified. And some are content with the mutation of their lusts. In their youth, they were adulterers. But now, in old age, they are worldlings, and therefore they are satisfied. And still, others are content to play and jest with their lusts, even as fencers do. They pretend to kill their lusts, but never really hurt them. Number three, as you prepare to mortify sin, be sure to apply the greatest part of your strength to killing your bosom or master sins. Where sin makes the greatest incursion upon your soul, that is where you must put up the greatest opposition and resistance. Do not do as Saul did with the Amalekites in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9. He spared Agag, their king, the best of the sheep and oxen, and everything that pleased his eye. He refused to utterly destroy them all as the Lord had commanded. Thus, many men kill their ordinary corruptions, but spare and indulge their great master and beloved sins. Number four, labor to see that your mortification includes not only scandalous, visible, and external sins, but also inward and secret evils. Remember, that inward and secret sins are more dangerous because they are so much more difficult to discern and detect in the heart. Oh, my beloved, when there are whole swarms of inward lusts that you allow to roam freely, taking no pains to capture, subdue, and suppress them, you are not even performing half the work of mortification. Number five, and finally, in mortifying your corruptions, take the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ along with you, for you are not capable of doing any of this without his help. Therefore, plead for help and assistance from the one who enables you to do all things, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And, quote, if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live, close quote. <laughs>